Pod. I'm Chris Hewitt, and welcome to this very special Three Flavors Cornetto Trilogy podcast. Celebrate the brilliance of Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright's, well, Three Flavors Cornetto Trilogy, which is, of course, the Rom Som Com Shaun of the Dead, the Rom Cop Com Hot Fuzz, and the Rom Rum Com The World's End. And yes, I know they don't drink rum in The World's End, but just go with it. Please. Just go with it. The trilogy is out now on DVD and Blu-ray, and to mark this auspicious occasion, Nick DeSimlian and I spoke to Peg and Wright just the other day for a mammoth, marathon, 75-minute-long interview spanning all three films and the history of the working relationship. The interview took place at the Sydney World Haymarket in London while we were waiting to go on stage for one of their final World's End Q&As, and I captured them in frank, funny, and reflective mood. Needless to say, this is filled with spoilers, for the trilogy, so don't listen to it until you've seen all three films. Enjoy. We're delighted to welcome on the Empire Podcast for an exhaustive Three Flavors Cornetto <laughs> Empire Podcast. Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg, welcome. Hello. Exhausted or exhausted? Ex- both. Good. Let's go for both. That's, um, that's one of our little. That's uh, one of your favorite like, words, isn't jokes. it? We like saying so. We like saying things that are only in trade reviews, like exhaustive doc. <laughs> talking in variety speak. We like to have an exhaustive commentary on our DVDs. <laughs> so let's make this commentary really exhaustive. Because right now we're in the uh, Sydney World Haymarket. We're about four stories above the screen, in screening where it's happening right now. Yeah. The World Sense playing for, I don't know, you, this yeah. is probably the last Q&A or second last Q&A you guys would be doing for first this one. First time in the West End, isn't it? Yeah. I know this is actually the first Q&A that we have done in this country for this movie. I know. It's one of the reasons we're doing three Q&As this week is because we felt guilty that time was against us and we had to go around the world and we never actually did a Q&A in you the UK. You did. What's that? You did. What do you mean? Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a mercenary bastard. I don't care. <laughs> Simon, <laughs> Simon didn't care. <laughs> Edgar feels. Edgar's got all the feels. <laughs> <laughs> but do you feel there's a, is there a sense of closure now coming in? Uh, with you got two Q&As left, three in your case, Edgar, of course. I felt closure. It's weird. I felt, I felt closure at various stages of this process. I felt closure on, on the last day of principal photography. I felt closure on the last day of pickups. Uh, of of the of the the LA premiere of the London premiere, you know it's weird. It's what it about the second day of pickups. Second day of pickups. <laughs> the third and fourth day of pickups, not so much. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 weird. It's little increments of closure. I guess I guess really when the DVD Blu-ray is out and and we've done everything in a, you know in the in the build-up to that, then it will be like, okay, that's it. There we go. You just go and stare into space for a while. Or is, is yeah, it? man, and love it. Enjoy it. Just think about it all. It's been you know it's it's been such a uh, a fun ride and, and it's only you know part one of a of a greater ride i think so it's it's nice to kind of it's good to feel we've had this, this when, <laughs> when we finished our last commentary i walked out and i walked up the up the road accompanied by the music from the end of incredible hulk <laughs> <laughs> with your bag slung over yeah. your back i feel like uh i feel like we've had this thing hanging over us for years because of space you know because it became it became like a running joke about the third you know this this mythic third series that we never did mm. and and it, I, I'm glad that we've completed something at least. You know, it's like people aren't going to go. So when are you going to do a third Cornetto film? Because we plumbing did it. You just ruined my next question, which was: Will there be a, <laughs> there a series of space? There'll be a fourth series of space, which is Nick's joke. <laughs> yeah, just just skip to that. We want to go back to the beginning. I mean, you know, in terms of this being an exhaustive podcast, right to the back to the very beginning, because you guys were in the same room at one point without knowing knowing about it. I think so. For, yeah, for we Akira. were. Is that, is that Bristol right? Bristol Watershed. Yeah. Big ups to the West Country. Um, <laughs> Bristol Watershed had an animation festival, I think, in 1988. That's right, yeah. And there was a UK premiere of Akira, and me and my brother were there, but unbeknownst to, to us. Elsewhere in the darkness. Simon Pegg was there, lurking like the editor of Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. we, we only found that out later, I think, when we either when we were doing Asylum or... I think when we were doing Space, because Akira I wrote it into up. the script. That's that, right. Yeah. And, uh, and we both said, like... Uh, that's weird. We, I was at the UK premiere of that. <laughs> what must you have... I, I was looking through David Wellem's biography yesterday. There's some pictures of you, and there's a picture of you and him and Matt Lucas on the set of Bernard Chomley's Stately Homes. Yeah. And I swear to God, you look like a child. <laughs> I, 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 did I know you then? And I did. We've, been, we've known each other for such a long time, it's crazy. I know. Because now you look like a man. I know. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> and the first time you met properly was you were doing some stand-up and you did a bit no, of... No, I was... Country. Funnily enough, well, I, was, I was seeing Matt and Dave at the, at the Riverside, Edgar Main <laughs> I, I always <laughs> you think... You finally conceded. I always think it's the, it's the, it's the art centre, but I think you're right. I think we met there again yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, we did with Nick, that's right. Because the I remember... I met Nick was at the Bassey Arts. That's right, because I remember when I did see you, I knew I'd seen you before because I remember thinking, who is that? 
Because I'm and I, or I, my memory of you is like you had a velvet jacket on. <laughs> Am I off? You you look like the doctor. I came up to um, yeah, it was at the Riverside Studios. I came up to Simon because I had seen, and you can find this on YouTube. This clip, uh, Simon on the Stand Up Show from yeah. 1996, maybe I or maybe like, 95. I look like Eminem. You do, <laughs> and I went up at, and because Simon had done a whole. Um, uh, routine about eight was it points west or HTV? HTV it was about the west country sort of local news channel and you know obvious stand up about sort of parochial sort of tendencies about students of, and traffic of local which then news is in hot fuzz. yeah absolutely <laughs> and uh, Edgar came over to sort of like you know said he because he, he obviously came from the HTV area and we bonded over that and and I, I I remember I knew he was connected with us now somehow it was because Matt and David sort of uh, I mean, groomed you really, didn't yeah. they? Uh, and I they, kind of... they had assumed I was gay, <laughs> and then I was part of their circle. <laughs> and this is before the internet. Wait, who's, um, this, who's this kid? He might be. It gay. wasn't so easy in those days. <laughs> you had to do it by mail. <laughs> Very slow process. And the irony was, they were grown up by the time they finally came round. <laughs> but no, that, and, and, and then and then I, I started to see Edgar around the Paramount Comedy Channel, and we were all it was a little hotbed of kind of creation. My family, Moore, who was a university friend of mine, uh, became a producer at the Paramount Comedy Channel and was producing, was charged to produce some domestic comedy for their for sort of buffers on the Paramount Channel, which was showing like Cheers and Seinfeld and stuff like that. Mm. And um, Matt and David got Edgar to direct their show, Mash and Peas, and I yeah. was doing a little show. The other connected tissue there that was, that's, that was funny is the reason I met Matt Lucas is I had seen him on another stand up show and he was doing stand up at the Fox on Palmer's Green, and I went up to him afterwards oh, yeah. because I had written the script of Crawl, and I sort of thought that, like, hey, here's this kid who's the same age as me. He would be funny in the script that I have written. So I sort of met him through that, and we became friends, and I met David, and then later, like, Fistful of Fingers came out and got one star in Empire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Bum tucks are free. <laughs> <laughs> Never gonna let us forget that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Caroline Westerbrook. Uh, I haven't memorized the review. Um, uh, How long was the review, by the way? It was only a short one. I remember. I do it was remember one star, it wasn't it? Was it? it was one star. <laughs> <laughs> Need I say more? No, the one nice brackets. thing, the only nice thing that it said is it said sort of like there's just enough talent in the director to, to predict that he might be ashamed in the future of foam horses. That was the one like nice thing to say that there is like and a are gem. <laughs> no, I I like the you know I've come I, I I at the time I was I think when I made that film which is very very silly I had a sort of a moment when I'd made it afterwards when I was editing it I suddenly realised that I'd committed something to film and there was no way back and I sort of realised that yeah. there was I realised the big difference between an amateur film and a professional film and yeah. mine was very much still in the amateur camp because when know? you worked with me it went up to four didn't it <laughs> <laughs> Simon literally added three stars <laughs> which I really where every film I do without you gets three stars <laughs> <laughs> that's it we only like together how does that explain Scott Pilmer versus the world five stars I know I know let's not make this about us guys <laughs> <laughs> although we haven't well, seen Caroline for a while say, <laughs> so, so Matt Lucas and David Williams went to see Fistful of Fingers and they hired me to do their show mash and peas on the paramount comedy channel and then when i was shooting that i remember simon was shooting dan doyle and so we ran into each other a bunch of times and that's because mafanwi who was a bristol alumnus uh she had got me and dave walliams in because we were friends of hers and she was basically you know getting the people that she knew to sort of bolster this little group of comedians so and that's how and then when we did asylum together we had a bunch of comics we did a first workshop and a bunch of comics got a bit funny about the subject material that because it, it was set in, in a mental uh, facility and yeah. people thought it was a bit sick and we were like no it's funny and uh, so a whole bunch of comics pulled out and we were left with a dearth of well were there any female characters and I'd done a sketch show for Meridian TV with a young actress by the name of Jessica Stevenson, who... Uh, Nay Hines. Nay, Nay, no, oh, no, Nay Hines. Nay Stevenson. Nay Stevenson. And I said, listen, I know this amazing... Because she'd blown my mind on this show. She'd come out. She'd come along with Katie Carmichael, who plays Twist yeah, and Spaced. Yeah. She'd just come with Katie to keep her company on the audition. I'd done the audition just for the hell of it. Blown everybody away at the audition. They gave her a role in the thing. She's all, I can't do it unless Katie does it. So <laughs> Katie got the part as well. I subsequently got a part in it as well. And worked with Jess and just fell in love with her completely because she was so, is so funny. And I said to Edgar, how about this girl? And sh so she did Asylum. And then at the end of Asylum, they said, you guys should do something together. And, and that was Spaced. We, Edgar, were you involved in the, the creation of Space at that point? Or were you not aware of it? 
No, I, I, I was in the sense that I read the first draft. I think early on, Simon and Jess went away to write maybe like four episodes. Or maybe I remember reading them after you'd done two episodes. And so I think very early on, my family or maybe you guys had said, Edgar should do this. And so you, I remember I reading think, the first drafts. But there's a gap between Asylum and Spectre. There was about a two-year gap at two least. Two years, yeah. Where you did the Steve Coogan tour and Big Train. Yes. And I did a bunch of BBC shows. Yeah. Um, you did Alexi Sale and uh, the French Sale. and Saunders. And the French and Saunders one Christmas special. <laughs> was that the Titanic the one? Titanic one. Edgar directed the Titanic one, well, which is a classic. It seems it Saunders. seems bizarre when that's on like sort of UK guard. I'm thinking, oh yeah, I shot that. Jess and I wrote, went off and wrote this script, which was a kind of flat share sitcom that was supposed to be single camera. That was our only directorial kind of contribution to the script that it was a single camera and no laugh track kind of deal. And I, we gave the scripts to Edgar, and Edgar came with this book of like, oh, I was gonna, and, and and his sort of visual style was kind of on the page. And I remember being around at Jessica's house and looking at this book, thinking, "Fuck me, this is amazing," you know. And he, okay, yeah, you, you're you're the one. And um, and because I've always maintained throughout, you know, always that it was the three. It was wasn't me and written by me, and it was written. The words were written by Jess and I, but the creation was Edgar, me, and Jess entirely because there's a whole vein of that show which is to do with how it looks, and that was you know entirely Edgar. So, I, in, a, in a sense, did you guys write together before you wrote together? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you did. You did. He was script I, editor anyway. So. Yeah, I sort of did script editing, especially on the second series. Well, for, you you were the one that had us rewrite the end of the first episode and turn it into that whole sort of you know thing with all the the misunderstanding oh yeah yeah the, yeah the there was not there was nothing at the end of the first episode yeah it just sort of petered out it just stopped yeah, <laughs> yeah. it did <laughs> yeah. i don't know page 17 that's it yeah full stop and did you show simon the stuff you were writing like cruel or did you keep that no he sure <laughs> <laughs> i still haven't read it yes you have you read some I of did, it I he said i remember after space chris, he, chris wanted me to bring it along today and so we'd read it loud and i said <laughs> I said Simon, or, I said good, Simon or rip it's, it to pieces. No, no, it's it's, it's totally there. It's all you know. You can see the the promise on the page. But um, he showed me a script he wrote written called Tinkle, which is about a guy yeah. who tries to answer the phone. And I remember he brought it to me, and I was I, I was. I was kind of like, oh, you, what, you want me to do this? I remember being quite surprised that you wanted to do something with me beyond space. And, yeah. I, and, and I felt quite privileged that you actually had kind of thought of me in that sense. Was what? that a TV idea? Or a no, feature? that was a short. I do remember, though, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flatter Simon now. Not, uh, not that he needs it, but like... Um, <laughs> Cover your ears. No, but when, when I was doing Asylum, I was so sort of impressed with Simon that I thought, even before any germ of Shaun of the Dead had come up, I thinking, I want to make a movie with this guy. Because, you know, I... I sort of, I think you, sort of, you realise that like, sort of, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a great position to be in to sort of be able to write a script together with somebody and you direct and somebody else star. It's, yeah. you know, those chances come along very infrequently. And I sort of meet a lot of people who want to kind of become directors and sort of like, I don't know how to get their voice across. And it's, sometimes it's like because you don't have somebody who can be in it or you can't write it yourself. And so I feel very lucky that like, I met Simon and we kind of had a sense, shared sensibility and then we could write a film that I could direct that he could be in. Mm. But I did use, I, way before we came up with the idea for Sean, I thought I want to do a film with Simon. And I'd written this short, which we never ended up doing. But I think it's the, I mean, you know, having done three films like that now, it's the ideal way to work, you know, in, in filming terms, because it gives you utter sort of hold on everything you know and, and we, 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 we sit down as writers and we, we work together as writers and then when we, we 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 get on set we fan out like the Falcon and the little X-Wing and Return of the Jedi <laughs> you know he goes off to direct I become the that lead was on, that was on TV today the lead actor. I happened to switch over just as that Ewok was dying did you? oh yeah. and the bit when he shakes it <laughs> yeah no. Uh, but and then and then we take on our very our, our respective roles on set and but it felt it, like watching a strange episode of Badger Watch. It's meant to have Bill Oddie, awesome Bill Oddie, awesome watch. <laughs> Bill, Bill Oddie's commentary <laughs> oh, on a dying Ewok. Chris Packham just weeping <laughs> on its body. As He'd probably be happy. He, he wants would. he wants pandas to die. Does Chris he? Packham, he does. Yeah. He doesn't think we should keep him alive. He thinks that natural selection has chosen him for extinction, wow. and we shouldn't intervene. Okay. Now, yeah. The podcast takes a dark twist. Yeah. Oh Bloody Packham. Anyway, you were saying <laughs> <laughs> that crazy, that deep that vein crazy, of hatred for Packham. <laughs> crazy Billy Idol lookalike. <laughs> no, he's different now. He's changed his haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Eric Idol. Yeah. So, in, in terms of uh, in terms of Sean, so when you guys got in the room together for the first time, you'd you'd worked together. You knew that you were compatible as writers, or but we hadn't or was written. A, I mean, we kind of, I mean, we we were very studious about it. We started off around Edgar's house. Um, 
watching a lot of films, we we we, we respectively read kind of. Sid, Sid, Sid Field, Field, who recently passed away this week. Mm. R.I.P. Right, yeah. Sid Field. Robert That's McKee. one of the. F- I don't know if we actually read the Robert McKee book. Isn't it the one that was it Sid Field's book, the one with the diagram and stuff? Yeah, in? Okay, exactly. that's the one I remember clearly. Although, funny enough, Robert McKee is a fan of Shaun of the Dead. We read like, that. Sort of, yeah, but we definitely did. There, there's the Sid Field book, R.I.P., um, had that kind of act, kind of paradigm thing. And what we would do is we would watch our favorite movies uh, or movies that were in the vein of the Shaun of the Dead screenplay, not just kind of content wise, but structurally. And we would match, we would try and match the events in the movie to his. Act chart okay. to see if the to math see if it worked. Okay, worked. yeah. And most of the time it did. You know, so we would watch things like Back to the Future or American Wealth in London or Gremlins or The Birds um, and try and match it to kind of the, the chart. So it was kind of a fascinating way of like breaking down your favorite movies into a kit of parts. Because I think it's kind of, it's sort of, you know, with Spaced, we'd come at things from left field. We tried to be a bit unconventional. And when someone says, This is how you do something, your immediate reaction is, No, it's not. I'll do it how I like. And we were just curious to see if those rules did apply, and they were, and they did, you know, and, and really good, well structured movies that g- genuinely satisfy you. Raiders, those kind of films that just kind of leave you think, oh, that was great, tend to have a development which is, you know, fairly uniform. And, and, and we, we basically discovered we weren't going to write three consecutive sitcom episodes, we had to write a different kind of animal. Yeah. And we found ourselves in this little upstairs attic, stinking room on Beak Street. No, it was, but um, it was the other B. Brewer Street. Brewer. It was on. No, it wasn't Brewer. Berwick. It was Berwick. It was no. Berwick. Berwick Street. The three Bs. Yeah, the three Bs. Seventy <laughs> something. Be, Seventy-three Berwick Street. Don't look for it. It's not there anymore. Uh, <laughs> we knocking shop these days. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it probably it was, was then, a to be honest. shop, and oh, then it was that yeah. rain room. Some Packing guy. is probably there. Killing pandas even now. <laughs> <laughs> Rain-coated men used to walk in and. You know, if we weren't if we weren't inspired that Just day, we'd give them, a, give them a hand job and uh, <laughs> get extra money for uh, press press a manger. Uh, <laughs> twenty twenty pounds for French. <laughs> I mean, it was the old rates, really. You know, like sixty for Greek. There was a there was a sign on the wall from the previous owner. We just used those. <laughs> we didn't know how to how to scale it. And then we moved to. Um, then we moved to Big Talk, didn't Busty we? Busty model with model spelled wrong. Model, <laughs> model spelled M-O-D-L-E. L-E. I always remember that there was, a, there was a sign nearby. French polishing. <laughs> model, model was spelled wrong. Like how, like, sort of, like, that's, that's a pretty... That's because like, she's French. Major, major French. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really genuinely French. Okay, sorry. We, sorry. We, 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 we deviate. This is, all, this is all new. This is all gold. This, this is all gold. We haven't um, done this in an interview before. <laughs> We're talking about wanking off. Uh, we haven't admitted just that. Random people walking you got, in. You've got to get a film <laughs> yeah, made. You've got to do yeah, things. That wasn't a ne'er do well. <laughs> I love that. Listen, first time filmmakers, you're going to have to do some things that you're ashamed of. If you're going to make, you want to make your first film, you're going to have to nosh off a few tramps. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small you've got price to a McKee style sort of <laughs> seminar. That was the first page of McKee. Nosh off a tramp. I know. It's Write it's a, a script. Very strange. Hero's journey. Um, I was going to ask which one of you types. But the thing that, the other thing, turns. well, uh, I think we both do actually. But the other thing that, that, that people always ask about writing, and it's like, oh, and listen, we, 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 the reason that we read all these books is because we'd never written a screenplay before. So we didn't kind of try and like sort of blunder in like naively and just think, yeah, we've done a TV show now, we can write a film. And if anything, we were daunted by it because we wanted it to be really good. So we read all these books. But then the thing is, is that, and this is where the flip chart thing comes in, the flip chart is essentially like making a big treatment. So I think the way is, if a screenplay is going well, you keep doing the, the treatment of the plot until you start writing the movie. Because mm. they sort of frequently, especially with something that's a comedy, dialogue starts to drive the plot. And so you have this document, and it's not just plot beats, it starts to become lines from the film as well. So if you look on the Blu-rays of any of the movies where we put the flip chart extra on, you can see as well as major plot beats are bits of dialogue that are driving the film along. So that was that was what we did, is we, and that's why we first recorded that. On the Shaun of the Dead like, um, DVD and Blu-ray, there's that flip chart extra, which was shot in um, our knocking shop in, was. in Berwick Street. Um, I think you can see me dabbing the corners of my mouth <laughs> when it starts. You can almost smell the talc. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to say talc. <laughs> that was good. 
Sorry, we'll stop talking about brothels. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. So, uh, the, the the in terms of getting shot off the ground, though, was it because um, it was quite tricky? It was quite mm. it was touch and go for a long, long time, wasn't it? So, were you yeah. writing the script even as you were trying to I sell it around? I look or? back on it as me being very, I was just very blithely sort of naive about. It. I just assumed it would get done. Edgar was obviously more in touch with Naira Park. Uh, and, and reality and reality <laughs> and Jim Wilson who well, but basically what happened was we it, it was being developed at film four uh, and we met up with um, uh, Paul Webster and Jim Wilson and they started they liked Paul we loved Paul because he distributed Evil Dead 2 when it came to the UK so it was like through, oh, Palace, yeah. through Palace it was it was all very sort of like oh this feels right and then film four had to scale down because they you know they um had to get smaller quite quickly and they very uh, kindly put the film into turnaround and we so we had it back. We took Jim with us, Jim mm. Wilson, mm. who stayed with the project. And eventually, on the morning that Joe Strummer died, we were all in Starbucks at the bottom of uh, Upper Street. I remember us discussing the fact that working title... I think that's you mixing two things up. Because I remember that Star- Starbucks was when yeah. went to working title. I think we met in Starbucks before we went there, maybe. But this I was remember we were in Iceland... <laughs> and when we got the call, oh yeah, we were in, we were in Iceland, and we got when we got the call that they were going to make it, and that was in like was like just before Christmas. But the Starbucks event was when we had the offer. It was like working title have said they'll do. Oh this. yeah, yeah. Do we shall shall we do it? And then we were sat around this table thinking, like working title with this <laughs> awful corporation. You know, little did we know how wonderful our relationship with them would be, but. We were like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, Edgar and I were over in Iceland towards Christmas just, uh, you know, watching a gig. And um, we weren't in that Blue Lagoon, were we? We were, we were <laughs> in the changing room of the Blue Lagoon. And also, it was... It, Which I remember is a brothel. It being, um, <laughs> I we Blue just, Lagoon is what, like, we a, a, a more, like, sort of volcanic spa. And we had gone... You were, we, you were there You were there watching Coldplay, and I was um, with... Uh, Ash. Charlotte because um, she was an Ash, she was supporting. So we were both there. But I remember it being a very tense time because... That's very much, that's very much us. I'm very Coldplay, he's very Ash. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but yeah, I remember, I remember getting that call that it was happening and it was like just before Christmas and then in March we were shooting it. But up until that point, that kind of like maybe, I think like Film 4 had gone down like a year before that or something. So it was a very tense kind of year of going rapidly broke and just kind of waiting out it may be happening. Yeah. And also for me at least, kind of turning down, I think a little easier for Simon doing acting jobs, but for me to take on a, a TV job meant that I was like pushing the film back. Yeah. So I got lots of TV offers and I was going rapidly... I was going rapidly broke. Well, I not even broke. I was like majorly in the red and I had borrowed money from Naira, David Walliams, my agent and Simon and I paid them all back except Simon who refuses to let me pay him back the 600 quid because he'll always have it over me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got him where I want him. <laughs> so I always, I always owe Simon 600 quid. Can you say what the TV yeah. stuff was that you... That oh, it's just like drama special. shows and stuff. Like things that, you know... The, not the bill with the other Nick no, Frost. No, no, no. No, not, no like sort of like kind of like... Um, you know, like TV drama stuff, the things that would have been good to do, but like, I knew that if I said yes, then I was basically taking my eye off the ball and Sean wouldn't happen. But I was really like seriously in the red and I was have to move out of my flat and my my landlord was really like sort of basically froze the rent. He actually reduced the rent because he felt I sort of, I told him I was moving and he said, why? And I said, I couldn't afford to stay there anymore. So he took pity on me and actually oh. reduced the, the, the rent. It just shows how in some situations with this, you know, getting films made, you have to hold your nerve. And oh, if yeah. You, if you don't, then, then these chances slip by and thank goodness you, uh, you did. No, and, you know, this is something we'd already done space and been, you know, nominated for BAFTAs for it and stuff. But it was still like sort of that didn't necessarily guarantee that the film was going to be made at all. I mean, Nick so, had, like, Nick so had gone back are, to serving, uh, f- uh, serving tables between the first and second series of Space. I mean, we were still, I think we did just... Did he do that after the second series of Space No, well? he did it between... Oh, yeah, I think he probably did do a bit of waiting after second series. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, it was all very touch and go, wasn't it? Yeah. And then so it, it, when we did it. Yeah. Well, did you guys not know you were getting the second series in between? I thought... No, we decided to do. Um, we decided to do the film, or we had the idea for the film during the first series, and it's. I guess spoke about it at length. We did the second series, and then we started writing. And it. then we started writing it because at that point we didn't want to do a third series. The second series was very tough to make. It was. Mm. We had it was very ambitious, and we didn't have m- many resources, and it so it used to give us headaches every day. And as fun as it was, it was tough and we didn't we thought oh let's try something else mm. <laughs> and that was Shaun of the Dead so <laughs> so when, when Sean was put in the turnaround 
um, and you guys were, did you pitch it to Working Title and other people or was it just yeah, Working Title? Yeah, we did. We, the funny thing is, is the Working Title was one of the, I think I went in there on my own, like maybe even between Space 1 and 2 really? and vaguely talked about our idea to Natasha Walton who were there at the time. And I really, I think because I was maybe, there was something I was, I was definitely nervous about Working Title because they were the biggest company that I sort of didn't really want to get, I didn't want to get a no from the biggest company. Yeah. So I think I sort of deliberately half-assed the, um, the interview. Um, and at that time it was called Tea Time of the Dead. I remember we had like a one page like Word document with oh, just yeah. the vague ideas. And then when we were doing the second series, then the ideas started to come together more. And I think we were also, when, when we um, talked about it, we were trying to sort of define what it is by saying what it wasn't. And they were like, we didn't want it to be like, it's funny because as much as people say, oh, it's like Evil Dead or it's like Brain Dead, it isn't, it isn't really. Like there's some things that carry over, but those films are much more kind of like um, stylized and even cartoony. And in a way we wanted to make it feel a bit more kind of um, mm. real and naturalistic and the comedy be naturalistic and the sort of the, the, the creeping threat feel more sort of real in a way. Yeah. And at this point so we a slightly no different idea. tone, you know? Yeah, we had no idea about 28 Days Later <laughs> yes. or uh, the Dawn of the Dead remake. But I remember you called me Rebirth. to tell me about 28 Days Later and I went mental. Yeah, yeah. Because we, I mean, as far as we knew, it was like, no one's done this for such a long time. We've yeah. been inspired because of Resident Evil and, that, and, and they'd really captured that sort of, you know, that classic zombie and it had, it would reignited our love of, from our childhood, and um, and so that's what. I, and and we thought, oh my god, no one's done zombies for ages. This feels so ripe for reinvention. And mm. and then suddenly it felt there was this collective subconscious thing going on. Even though Danny's film is not a zombie film, and he's he always maintains that it's not a zombie film. The the Dawn of the Dead one very much, yeah. with the title and that, uh, <laughs> and all that coming yeah. out a week. But we seemed like the, the, the most sort of um, on the nose. To, to the to the uh, you know uninformed observer, we look like a really quick parody. It's funny. I uh, told James Gunn recently because I'd never told him that we actually got hold of a copy of the Dawn of the Dead remake script to make sure there was no overlap. And the one thing that there was overlap then didn't end up in their film, and we cut it out of ours as well. <laughs> so there was one. Th what is weirdly there was one joke that was in his script because uh, a lot of his scripts wasn't in the actual finished film yeah, yeah. that we had in our film and we cut it out Which but they, was it? it was the jogging zombie of course that we had yeah. one thing that was one, that you saw a zombie jogger and then later he was the only one that was running <laughs> yeah we had a running zombie in the script that's just, right and it was, but just one it was because he was all he did in life was jog so he was able to run his in muscle death. memory <laughs> yeah uh yeah, that's right. But it wasn't in either film in the end. No, it, it became Chris Dickens running from a zombie yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in the walk across to the to the shop, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. He turned up in World War Z, I think. <laughs> yeah. Was, was, was <laughs> yeah. Hot Fuzz floating around at that point? Was there the seeds of that? Because obviously you have the paintball sequence in space, which is you obviously loving doing the action stuff in that. Not really. I mean, it was something that like I, I had, th I, I guess I had thought about doing something with it before Shaun of the Dead in terms of like, I did like the idea of doing a rural cop film. And so I guess it was probably sort of lurking in my the back of my mind a little bit, but definitely wasn't something that we even talked about until we'd done Sean. I mean, it's funny now, and, and, you know, it's nice to be given credit for, like, sort of the idea of, like, a sort of a 10-year plan, because people say, when you were back in Sean and Dead, were you planning, like, all these <laughs> references in the, in, or, like, callbacks and stuff in World's End? It's like, no, we, we were just happy that we were making a film. And it wasn't really until even it came out in the U.K., that we even knew it was going to get released in the rest of the world. In fact, it was it was going to go straight to video in the states, like um, until it came out in the UK, and then when sort of people on the internet started kind of buzzing about it, then it got mm. a theatrical release. No, it's fair to say that the, the internet like interest in the states by that like, websites like Ain't It Cool got it a release in, mm. in in the US. I think if it hadn't been that, it might have just gone straight to. But but it wasn't until then we started thinking about the next film. And I think, Simon, you were a little bit re resistant to the cops idea initially. Well, yeah, because I think Shaun of the Dead had been such a kind of, a, 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 it was such a sort of collaborative germ, whereas the germ of Hot Fuzz was very much Edgar, and I had nothing better to bring to the table, so I, I felt like, okay, I'll go along with this idea. And it took me a little while to kind of find the love for it in the writing process, but I think once... Once we started doing... Once you started training. Once we started getting <laughs> fit, yeah. No, we started doing research with the cops, which, you know, at first I was like, oh, man, you've got to work. And then, uh, and then they started to tell us these amazing stories in it. And we went off on a little trip, didn't we, to yeah. a bunch of different constabularies. And uh, that was fascinating. And, and, it, and it started to take shape for me. Um, 
so by the time we, we came to shoot it, it was, you know, I was um, fully 100% sort of mm. into it and um, ready for it as well because I got in shape. Yeah, it was, I mean, even though it was something where there's an element, all, all three of the movies are personal, you know, the sort of, Sean one is the most obvious because it's a character living in North London about to turn 30. In Hot Fuzz, you know, we've never been cops and yet we are both <laughs> from, like, the west of England. So yeah. it was something about where we uh, a film about where we had grown up and and lots of those aspects of it come into it and and all of the you know the supermarket stuff and stuff about Freemasons is all kind of from personal experience <laughs> yeah. in a way but um but the thing that was interesting was doing yeah doing the research was really interesting but also you know we did a lot more kind of like groundwork than we had to do with Sean which is basically just coming straight from our brain and I did remember once this this time I think we wrote in Big Talk on Great Titchfield Street, but I do remember That's one right. time we were having a particularly tough day, especially trying to work out like the Agatha Christie style plot, which we give major credit to Agatha Christie for making it look easy when it's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> but I do remember one time you like banging your head against the wall and just going, I just want to be in front of the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Simon just gave up. For, like, and that, so for free, like, it would be like, and it's, you know, like, I think actually out of the three scripts, the World's End was the most fun to write or was the one where it had been like sort of in our brains for so long that when we actually turned yeah. on the tap, it just came all And also out, Hot know? Fuzz was very much that difficult second album. You know, we kind yeah. of like, the, the initial draft for Hot Fuzz was about 185 pages long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it became like we, we, we didn't, it didn't have the leanness or the economy of Shaun of the Dead. It was this great big sprawling, very complicated. That's because we'd written in all the ITV2 breaks. Yeah, true. We'd written in, <laughs> all, the, we'd written in all the adverts. <laughs> and bumpers. It wasn't on today. <laughs> it was, Weird. It was the few days it wasn't on. I've written to my MP to complain. <laughs> But we, uh, you know, we, we sort of did this big splurge and then we had to edit and edit and edit. And it was a, it was a much more strenuous sculpting of the first draft down to something a little leaner. Mm. Whereas The World's End was pretty much, because we'd learned from that experience, The World's End was, the first draft of it is very, very similar to what you what you see on the screen. Yeah, we when we made The World's End, we actually wrote a script and we said, we said no. Yeah, I always have, I have this bet with Eric Fellner <clears throat> of whether the, uh, the assemble edit is going to be under two hours long because usually assemble edits are crazy long like sort of like an assemble edit for like a two hour movie can be four hours long mm. and the Sean like assemble edit was under two hours and um, th and the World's End one was so I usually have a bet with Eric Fellner about whether it'll be under that the, the assemble edit for Hot Fuzz though was two and three quarter hours long and so obviously wow. that came massively down but it was something especially when you're kind of like up against it budget wise like it's a good thing to kind of you know just plan to have everything in the movie or like there's nothing that can really be cut out you know yeah I mean that was one thing that we've sort of always done is is come to set with a script and with stuff to shoot and never uh, never anything to figure out on the day mm. I mean maybe a little bit of blocking here and there once you get into the set things might change but we have a lot of rehearsal time where we make sure that anything that might slow us down on the day is dealt with so we come to set with a film to shoot you know I I, I, I always marvel at people who come to set and go okay uh, when are we going to do that because <laughs> yeah, you just yeah, think yeah. oh my god you can hear the, the money just ticking away and it just helps our style if we know exactly what we're doing but your scripts are so intricate I mean you know, there's, there's even a bit on the uh, the world's end making of where you not rail against necessarily but you do say that you don't want to be like certain American comedies where you turn up on, on set and just improvise the entire thing and not that improvisation on your sets is a four-letter word necessarily, but it is certainly something that you discourage, or because you well, seem to be very prepared and very. <clears throat> I think it's just because the, the 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 scenes I hope are quite tight in terms of each line leads on to the next. I mean, that's it. Is that I don't think you could like that scene with the pronouns. Like, yeah. You couldn't improvise that because yeah. it's sort of too there's the, the, it's too many rapid fire interjections and each. The main thing is each line is leading on for the next. Because for the most part, and I've got nothing against kind of improvised films, because whether it's Robert Altman or the Jan Apatow approach, when it works, it's like gold. But the downside to it, when you see bad ones, is it's just all arguments. Because that's the only thing you can really improvise, is like, you think this, you think that, go at it. Mm. That's the only thing you can really like and do. And even, even like kind of, <clears throat> and even like Kirby Enthusiasm is designed like that. You know, if you see one of the scripts for that show, it's kind of fascinating where they have the scenario and they just kind of like, argue around it and stuff and get to the, the, the plot point. But I think we just like, well, one is that the films are really ambitious and so we, 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 we're incredibly meticulous in terms of, I was going to say anal, 
Um, we're very meticulous. Get back to that place. <laughs> yes. no, I think that's I think that's eighty pounds. Um, <laughs> it wasn't called anal. <laughs> Wait, what's that? Called? There's a name for it, isn't there? Anal talc. French, French polishing is that one? That <laughs> no, one? That, the French polishing is the other one. Let's not go about that. Okay, don't worry. <laughs> um, uh, I think it's one thing. That I, one thing that's, that, uh, that I've just had this epiphany. One of the one of the key films that Edgar and I cite as influence and influence on us is Raising Arizona. And mm. when I watched that film. Uh, when I was a kid, I realized that the directorial style of the movie was almost like a character in the film. So it was like the way that the camera moved and the way that the Coens used the camera to be funny, it was like another presence and it was like another character. And I think that's the thing with, with our films is that Edgar's directorial style has the presence of a character. And if, if one person's improvising in a scene, then everyone has to improvise. And that character can't improvise because it's so yeah. strict you know yeah. so we have to be in line with Edgar's directorial style and that's not a burden on us it helps us enormously but it means that the, you know all the transitions are very tight all the, the, the dialogue can echo we can plan stuff out a lot uh, we can do a lot of foreshadowing a lot of paying off and it's just a more satisfying kind of structural adventure than, than just kind of making it up some people can do that and they do it really well Seth Rogen's guys uh, dab hands at it and it's a different style of comedy and one that I really enjoy but it doesn't work for what we do did he do that much on Paul? Seth. Impro. Well, interestingly enough, we it was Seth was kind of we messed around in rehearsals, and then Joe Latrulio, who did a lot of Paul's lines on yeah. set, he did impro, which then Seth recreated to make it sound like he was making up on the you know because obviously you can't have a CGI character improvise. But we <laughs> wanted to see if that would happen. Not yet. Anyway. Not yet. Anyway, that's another. No, look at Edgar you're scowling. <laughs> <laughs> do you have to do you have to uh, tell actors going in that there's not going to be any improv? Do you sometimes get people who are a bit surprised by it? The only times I've had. I mean, I think because the script is pretty tight, people stick to it. I don't think you really have too many times people have gone off. The only time I've noticed that is sometimes actually is um, more when I was doing Scott Pilgrim, I would do auditions with actors, and they would like improvise on top of it, but the only thing they do is add extra swearing. And you would sort of like be... Oh, that's thinking, a very actor thing to do, that. Yeah, just yeah. add extra fucks. And so you're thinking, well, it is a PG-13, <laughs> so that's not going to fly. <laughs> I mean, in our film, there's already swearing in it, so people don't feel the need. But I've noticed that on other auditions that sort of like the main thing that actors contribute when they're improvising is just extra swearing. That's because subconsciously you feel like it's going to make you funnier if you yeah. swear, so you do it as a means of trying to, you know, get a, a, a approval. Yeah, but Alison Jones, who's an amazing casting director, it happened so frequently, it was almost my bug by saying, why does everybody, and it was always actors, never actresses. It's always <laughs> actors adding F-bombs to everything. Yeah. And one time, while somebody was actually, after I'd complained about it a couple of times, she had this kind of clipboard, and while somebody was talking and they started doing it, she kind of held it up so I couldn't see it and then put it down. And after the guy, the guy went red and then fumbled the rest of the audition. And then as soon as he left, I said, I know what's written on that piece of paper. And she looked at that and said, please don't swear. <laughs> Which was amazing. <laughs> but um, I think pe people that come in to like work with us, I think, just you know, they try and just make the most of the part that they're given and stuff. Well, we usually like do the, it. The, old, the guys that you know, we had this incredible uh, group of actors for Hot Fuzz. You know, we we wanted the film to be in in in, in a sort of Agatha Christie vein, peppered with stars, so mm. that you made it. It was easy for you to remember the characters. You know, when you had when you have a lot of characters, if they're famous, you remember them. It's more easy to remember them. And so we got this wonderful group of of older actors who who you know it was just a, a joy every day to work with them. And I think they really appreciated the structure. You know, they they when you get young people, they come in and they want to mess around. It's comedy. They they want to do their thing. They're the harder ones to deal with. But anyone who's an actor and who appreciates the structure of a script mm. is quite happy to, you know, have it all there for you because it means it's easier in a way. I think this, this whole impro thing has come from, it's, I don't know, it's sort of, it's relatively new when it comes to comedy. People think, oh, that's how you do comedy. Mm. You make it up. <laughs> no, well, it's not. Yeah, but which is not to say that you're not completely closed to that sort of thing because I know, for example, that you take a lot on in the rehearsal period and yeah. you give, yeah. they give the scripts to, uh, to Nick Frost and... He'll input, you know, you'll take his input on board. Smash yeah, if, if a funny joke comes yeah. out of yeah. the rehearsal, it'll be in the movie. Like, I think there's a couple of, like, yeah, smashy, smashy Eggman, I think, we came out of the rehearsal. That was mine, wasn't it? I think it was, like, you and... It was it was a sort of, like, a one-two. It was basically you and Nick together or something kind of came... Yeah. Yeah, that's, God, that's, that's lovely. Well, Nick's that. not here, so let's say it's yours. <laughs> 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 You did Smashy Smashy, he did Eggman. Egg yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's that thing of like, let's, let's see what is thrown up when we start, you know, because we both, I mean, Martin, Paddy, Eddie, they're all such sort of 
inventive guys and Nick has always been our secret weapon so we're never not gonna we, we're not tyrants you know we don't come and go this is what you're gonna say we have time to, to, to for stuff to come up and funny stuff comes up and we laugh a lot and then if it really works then we'll put it into the script it's just that when we get to the set that's when it sort of like locks and that's when we have to kind of abide by what's there because otherwise it'll cause problems mm. so yeah we're always up for for you know riding other people's coattails if they're promoting <laughs> funny lines and claiming that it was theirs on podcast who came up with which title I think you guys do great titles particularly Hot Fuzz which I think is an amazing title uh, who came up with that I think that was you wasn't it you, but you wanted it to be double T yeah the, the, <laughs> We, we disagreed on for a long time and Simon was of course correct is I wanted it to spe spelt with two T's <laughs> so and I think I said like to you do you like want for teen slang. in Q&A's with the rest of our lives people to go why is there a second T <laughs> <laughs> I think we only the, yeah it was the Hot Fuzz was I think that was always the top title and the only other one was Blue Fury but Hot Fuzz just sounded it just like sort of jumped out I do more. say Blue Fury in the film don't yeah. I? I say bring down the Blue Fury <laughs> What about the world's world, end? World's end never had another title because it was kind of inspired by the pub itself. And in fact, I think even before we had the story fully locked down, I just used to think about that pub name thinking, it'd be great to do a film called The World's End that sort of revolves around this pub. Because so we, we had history, and we all have history at that pub. The, yeah. the, pub, the world's end in Camden. There are many world's ends around the UK and... and, and um, it, it, you know, it's, it's quite a common pub name, uh, more common than you think. But we, Edgar and I used to go there p prior to going to the Odeon Camden where we watched a lot of movies. Mm. Uh, I had my first date with my wife there, Nick and I. Cla had, classy first date, sir. Yeah, classy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, you'll meet you at the world's end. Um, <laughs> Nick spectacularly fell off the wagon there once. Uh, a very memorable night. Was um, it, well, did he fall off the wagon as he was watching you have your first date with your future wife? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, he was he so goes, depressed. He's, going, he's leaving me. <laughs> I'm losing him. <laughs> uh, no, but that, so that pub kind of had resonance with us. And we shot the, you know, the, the, the slow motion gunfight in, in space, which became one of the sort of key scenes in that series, was shot at the back of the World's End. You know, yeah, it's yeah. In the alleyway. It's right by the Camden Top. You can, if you walk out of the one side of the World's End, you can see that alley. Yeah, you know. So it was always at the end of the alley for us. That, that we, weirdly, the last time we had been to the World's End until recently was the first night that Shaun of the Dead opened because we went to sneak in. Me, you, Naira, and Chris Dickens went That's to sneak right. in at the like the, the last midnight night, showing, midnight showing yeah. or ten thirty showing or something like that. Yeah. And we went to the World's End before, but that was until recently when we had some sort of wrap drinks at the World's End. That was the last time I'd actually been there. <laughs> Toilet uh, still smell. <laughs> <laughs> at one point, wasn't there a World's End poster above the World's End? Sign. No, Did that was that? for something was else. That was that was for Brandon Generator. They had a poster about. Oh, of course, yes, 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 yes. I was just going to ask about titles. Uh, I read that Spaced was going to be called Lunched Out at one yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> uh, it was a Brighton expression. It was Jess's, and she she it was it meant kind of like if you're a bit lunched out. It was, uh, but it sounded too much like advertising, yuppies, advertising executives okay. kind of thing. Right. And Spaced uh, just felt like it had so many meanings, mm. you know, and uh, and it was my idea. <laughs> and I'm taller than Jess. I know that's the thing is that there's no other title for the world zone because otherwise you could have lunched out, tea time of the dead, <laughs> blue fury, but there is no alternative. The great, oh, that's that, that's an alternative uh, Cornetto trilogy. Yeah, tea time of the dead, blue fury, and but there is no other title for the world zone. No, there isn't. Ever, no, never. No. In terms of the uh, autobiographical input. Uh, there seems to be a lot of, of you in the world's end, Edgar, but what about you, Simon? Is there a, a lot drawn from your experiences in the, in the movie? Yeah, there's a lot of me in the world's end, and, um, you know, a lot of it is um, it's probably something I'll never talk about. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, I, I, I totally relate to Gary. I know people who are like Gary, and, and um, there's a lot of a personal investment in Gary King for me. I love Gary. I, a lot of people say, oh, Gary's a pain, but he's not. He's in pain, you mm. know, and I think that was the that my route to playing him was to, to not think, oh, he's a dick, you know, I, I, is, to, I, is to love him and kind of realize that he's driven by quite dark forces and dark impulses which, which govern his decisions, you know, and mm. it, he's kind of, it's not that he's selfish and horrible, he's, uh, he's unwell and that makes him that way, you know. Yeah. And so it was kind of something that I just wanted to go into seriously and play him, you know, I've had experience with people like that and, and I didn't want to, I, uh, Greg Hempel from uh, Still Game, very funny Scottish comic. Was, we were talking on Twitter today, and he said something about just because you make light of something doesn't mean you think lightly of something. And I think that really goes for this movie. You know, it has a very serious core. Yeah, I think the thing is, that, I mean, you know, we we think that like Gary's heart is in the right place at the start. He genuinely wants to get the gang back together, but then as soon as he realizes he can't have that because they're adults and they're all different, he starts to kind of like um 
you know deviate from the plan in various destructive ways. Yeah. But I think his, he 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 definitely wants to. All, all he wants is to be with his teenage friends again. But he <laughs> can't Gary, have that. He can't have that when they're forty. Yeah. All Gary wants to be is is happy, and that's that's what he's de- his quest really is for happiness, and that's why, despite everything, at the end he's kind of happy, <laughs> you know, and that's why he's quit drinking because he was always the the reason he drank was because. It was the only thing that either distracted him from the fact that he was unhappy, or it gave him a very brief amount of happiness. You know, a few people Spo- get in touch. Spoiler with you. alerts for people. Spo- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen it. Back up. As we come on, put like a klaxon earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine <laughs> they've seen the movies. So if they're listening to this, if they're not, more fool them. But um, yeah, you're going, have, have you had people from, say, alcoholism support groups come up to you and well, talk about the film and talk about its impact? Yeah, there's it? been some amazing things on written online about about it actually and about how it. We, nicely, I mean, you know, it's a vindication for us because we we weren't taking these things lightly. But for people to understand what it's saying about addiction and about, you know, the kind of the selfishness of that illness and stuff. And um, the worst thing it would be if people went, "Oh, that's not very nice." To, to not be, be funny that because uh, essentially the film, you know, again, spoiler alert, is uh, we th- always thought it was a funny thing that it was a film about a sort of <laughs> suicide on the run from a <laughs> psychiatric hospital. It doesn't sound like the the, the log line for a comedy, but. Um, it, it. <laughs> he wanted it to be like that. He 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 run, The film is basically Gary runs away from his intervention at the start, and he sort of has a second intervention from the friends at like the half hour mark, where they yeah. all turn on him and sort of send send some hard truths to his face. So that's the uh, intervention number two, and then intervention number three is the network, which is a, a cosmic intervention. Yeah, and it's all and in so a sort you know of even that they're in in like, in a circle. Like they're in, a, in an encounter kind of group at the end. Mm. That was the idea, and it was that thing. And if you notice throughout the movie, that like sort of Gary only really opens up when he's one on one with somebody, either like whether it's with the teen in the bathroom, who he's much more confessional and honest to, with Nick, with Rosamond. But when there's any, so even the final scene in the World's End, where it's like sort of Gary and Andy together, and like lots of. Um, you know, kind of um, realities come kind of flooding out. As soon as the, he's then in front of the network and the whole town, he kind of like puts his his armor back his on. armor back on and starts, you know, you know, being the sort of the the bluffing kind of um, yeah bullshitter the ni- of legend. A, you know, there's a nice moment that I really love. That I'm really proud of in uh, in the scene when Gary follows uh, Sam into the toilet for the first time, and she says, and she asks him what happened, and it's it's preceded by. One of our favourite jokes in the script, which is about the uh, the Gary's explanation of why the disabled is out of order. Uh, but after she says, "No, what happened to you?" and it's like he, I, I don't. The way that we played that, Ros and I, was that Gary doesn't expect to be skewered like that, and yeah. you see it in his face very briefly that she's oh fuck, she's seen me, she's on to me, she's on to me, you know, and you see him. He's, you see him panic for a split second, and it, 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 it's lovely. And I'm glad the takes Edgar used were really uh, uh, well chosen because it, it just you just see it for a second. But it answer your question as well. Like the, one of the things that was amazing online, there was a couple of things, and one was this article by that guy, film critic Holt, which is really kind of in depth, where he sort of said that in watching the film that it made him come to terms with the fact that he has like has an alcohol problem in a way. And then reading the comments on that article was amazing because a lot of people felt a similar way is that they said, because they, you know, somebody said, I remember this in the press said, most depictions of on-screen alcoholism are, are about like redneck wife beating mm. southern like sort of drunks, mm. and to see somebody who is more of a sort of a social functioning alcoholic is something that's a bit more close to home for a lot of people. So I mean, the thing is with these movies, and this is why when you read like the log line. You know, on the back of the DVD goes, hilarious, gut busting fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, there is there is a Trojan horse element with these movies. In the same way that, like, you know, you wouldn't sell Shaun of the Dead on the scene where Shaun shoots his mother in the head. And in the same way, World's End, there, there's like sort of like, I I I never like to use the word dark because dark sounds like you're sort of striving for effect, and it's more the thing of being honest. Yeah. So there's sort of maybe an honesty that comes out of it. Um, but but we we like to. There's an element of Trojan horse tactics with these movies is that you kind of like make a sci-fi comedy, but you smuggle in a more personal film in amongst it. Mm. The kind of film that you wouldn't actually be able to make otherwise. Do you know what I mean? No, it's absolutely. A sort of film. And even if you did, nobody would go and see it. You know? So it's a very nice thing for us to actually... And one of the things we're most proud of with these three films is that we've managed to talk about our upbringing or like our lives through like three wildly different genres. Even Hot Fuzz is like, you know, as we've kind of talked about a lot on the commentary, it's a lot more personal. Even though it's ridiculous, it's a ridiculous movie. There's lots of like things that have come from our lives mm. that are in that movie. So 
it's that that's one of the greatest things about doing these films is that sort of like we're able to put so much of ourselves in there because it's that weird thing is when screenwriters when you have that kind of thing from like screenwriting teachers they say write what you know and we have done that but with a zombie film a cop film <laughs> and an invasion film and that's mm. that's absolutely right is that yeah. everything in there is is from our lives we've been there we've been those characters yeah but, but going back to gary i mean gary for me is such a, a bold undertaking um, and I do know some people who've seen the film who did have problems with Gary, and I'm sure you, you've had that yeah. in yourselves. I'm sure if you'd made this in, under the studio system, and I know you have Universal on, on board this, you would have had a lot more notes to dampen him down and to soften the edges. Did you did you have anything like that when you were making it? Because you really commit to this character. Yeah, actually, we've all, we we have a very we have a great support network around us. Uh, uh, you know, Eric Fellner's who who is ostensibly our kind of boss that we answer to is always. You know, he'll give us notes and stuff, but he trusts us implicitly. And we really wanted to not wuss out with Gary, you know, and, and not necessarily redeem him particularly. You just have him go on a journey. But, you know, we wanted him to be the villain as much as the, the hero of the movie. That was a really interesting idea of having this guy be simultaneously, you know, evil and good, you know. And and I, I really wanted to just test the audience into sympathizing with him you know mm. and kind of to the point where you re when you reveal what's really going on with gary that you if you if you don't sympathize with him you might think oh maybe i was a bit hasty you know <laughs> and when when and and what happens to him eventually in the film is kind of i think it's 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 sort of positive even though it's it the ending is we was willfully divisive we wanted it we didn't want to pussy out on the title of the movie mm. And we wanted to give the audience something to think about when they left and, and, and chew over and not for it all to be the status quo returned. And, you know, because that's the worst thing you can do in a, in a movie is that you, you upset people's kind of expectations for a little while. Then you put everything back together neatly and they walk away and they forget the film in a couple of days, a couple of hours. You know, this we wanted people to just kind of wanted to poke people in the ribs with it a bit, you know. But there's also, I think, sort of the idea of the ending is that it's kind of we, we think it's the happiest ending of the three in a yeah. way even though like sort of it's um sort of it sucks for earth the five characters have found <laughs> some kind of like personal happiness and in a way i think sort of like quite a few people have that like even in the back of their mind have that kind of off the grid fantasy about like you know what would happen if you just kind of like you know max and cell phones went completely mm. um and the, in a way like the characters all thrive you know like andy has become the hunter gatherer you know, uh, he's back with his wife. Um, Peter has got together with Sam and is like sort of living the kind of like the pioneer life. Steve. Steve, sorry, Steve. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what Jeez. happened? What happened to the uh, the fitness instructor? She's twenty six. <laughs> Did she survive? He never wanted her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She survived, I'm sure. She's, She's twenty six forever. She hit. She hid <laughs> under a. She hid under a Pilates machine. <laughs> But we, we kind of, uh, we, 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 the, the idea that we had very early on, we went away to Carly Manor when we, when we devised the story and we came up with the whole idea of the network. And I remember the first, the first thing in the network that we said, it was like Facebook in space. Yeah. It was like this kind of network that everyone belonged to and, you know, Earth was being dragged into it. But one of, the, one of the key things, in the same way that we always wanted Sean to end up with Ed in the shed at the end of Sean of the Dead, that ending preceded the majority of the writing. You know, that's where we wanted to get to. We wanted Gary to be with his young friends again in a sort of darkly ironic thing. And we and originally it was time travel, wasn't it? But we realized yeah. that was a... It was like a sort of... It was too big a third act thing. It wasn't like um, we didn't have the rest of the movie. Yeah. Is we wanted it to have like the cheating, movie and it? then like them go back in time to sort of like um, 88. But then it felt like sort of... It was a bit too like sort of... It just felt like too late to in, in introduce that. And if you're going to make a film about time travel, it may as well be the entire film. Hot pub time machine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, like, in fact, in a weird way, you know, strangely enough, like something like that, as soon as I saw the trailer for that film, I said, let's not do time terror. <laughs> you know, let's let's ditch that. And it was already what we had. It was almost too similar to something like Back to the Future 2 anyway, yeah. the idea of going back and being uh, and being in the prologue. So, but then it actually sort of helped inspire then what was the main thrust of it is that the blanks themselves can become the fountain of youth. So what Gary really wants is to be 18 again. And yet, when he's given the chance to be in his 18-year-old body, he rejects it. So that's Gary's first kind of, like, progressive move, is to literally kill his younger self. <laughs> he has a chance. This is what he's wanted all the time, is to be 18 again. And yet, when he's given the chance to be in Thomas J. Law's body... And who wouldn't? <laughs> I'd love to be in Thomas J. Law. <laughs> <laughs> 
he he you know kind of like rejects it. So and of it course was that's a big that's a, that's that's another kind of irony as well in that you know Garrett you discover and this is obviously uh, completely spoilerific now this podcast but there we go. Um, we can't hang on to that forever. Uh, you know, Gary has tried to kill himself, and then, you know, uh, 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 10 minutes after you found out that, he literally does kill himself on screen, but it's just not himself that he <laughs> yeah, kills. You yeah. know, he kills that part of himself. Yeah. And it's interesting, and, a little, and it's something that I, we were so pleased with. When we, we actually reshot the very last sequence in the bar, um, because we, 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 we just wanted to tweak it, and I was actually shooting something else um, in which I was clean-shaven. And we were talking about, oh, no, what are we going to do about that? And we suddenly realized it was better if Gary was clean shaven because it was mm -hmm. like he was looking as young as he possibly could with his, with his young friends. And it was a physical change for him. You know, he'd sort of sh he'd smartened up a little bit. And so when he pulls down his mask, it's like he's all clean shaven. And yeah. it worked really well because it, it was looked like he was he changed, you know. Yeah. Prior to that, like we'd done almost identically the same scene for the ending, except he had a beard and it had slightly less dialogue. And we just wanted to kind of be, you know, a bit more explicit in a way. So that's where his little monologue that recalls back to the first post and refers to the Three Musketeers. Because crucially, the things that he does in terms of it being like two steps back for the whole world, but one step forward for Gary is that he's not drinking and he's sticking up for his friends. The key thing he does in that end scene is stick up for his friends. So it's very easy to get rid of that time travel idea when we realize, oh, what we want is already there. Like, if you have the young clones, that's who he's with at the end. He's not with, like, his teenage friends. He's with, like, the clones of his teenage friends. So he has his band of brothers. And also because we kind of, like, not that to get too sort of deep into it, you know, we, we thought that maybe, like, most of Gary's problems come from kind of, like, an absent father. And so the idea that the blanks are orphans is that he switches allegiances to them. Like, he's mm. now the king of the blanks mm. because they're all orphans. They've been, like, completely neglected and kind of abandoned by their father, um, the voice of Bill and I. Yeah. Um, and so they need somebody to lead them. So we like the idea that Gary now becomes the leader of the blanks. He's going to sort of take on the, the orphans and become like, um, you know, like a gothy Fagin. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Gothy Mad Max. Um, I'm just curious whether you've had people write university dissertations about any of your films because you you wrote about films at Bristol. I did, yeah, yeah, I have, absolutely. People, um, it, I, you know, I, I always have one eye on when we write that that what people will say about the films, you know, and 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 um, and what they will reflect in terms of what's going on in our heads socially and what have you. And um, I hope we've given people some meat to chew on, you know, and, and interpret. And because there's loads of stuff. Like you could, I was thinking the other day, you could you could look at Gary, and it's uh, ironic in a way, I guess. No, it's not ironic. It, it, you can look at Sean, Nicholas, and Gary as all because Gary, Sean is an orphan. No, Sean has Sean's father died. I think probably Nicholas Angel's father was. Uh, was slightly absent and he relied on his uncle who betrayed him in the end and Gary's father was uh, it didn't care about him mm. so you've got three characters who are all essentially abandoned in some way by their fathers and um, you know my dad left I had a great relationship I have a great relationship with my dad but he left when I was seven I'm sure something of that went into the writing you know my own view of mm. I had a bad relationship with my stepdad that whole thing about he's not my dad yeah. in Shaun of the Dead was kind of come from, came from reality so I think as a university student, you could definitely do a, a thesis on, you know, uh, abandonment, paternal trauma in the Condessa yeah. trilogy, yeah. you know, or in 10,000 words. Is that whole yeah, that, that, yeah that, that runs through all three of them, is the, is the notion of being a, a lone voice against a, a sort of homogenizing force. You've got the zombies, the NWA, and the network are all these forces of kind of collective change, which our heroes are standing against, you know. I think there's a thing, is that, so, and I think all of them have that, you know... Um, the, you know, the, if, if the arrested development thing, but also kind of like a fear of growing up. Like, I think Sean has that, Gary has that, like, Danny has that in Hot Fuzz. That's where that sort of comes from, is like, Danny doesn't want to really face the realities of life. Well, Nicholas Angel has it to the point where he enforces it on himself so completely, he can't, he has to force loosen himself to, to, to loosen up in yeah, order yeah. to win the day, you know, to, to, to dumb down a little bit. Mm. But... You know, and, and things like, I, I, I find that I'm sort of like, um, the, the big element of Gary that's me is that thing of like um, being overly nostalgic and also wanting to recreate things. Like I, I feel like sort of, maybe the, the, the film was actually therapeutic in sort of like dealing with it in some way, but I always used to think about 
the past and going back and doing things again. Never wanting to do things that I did well again, but just wanting to go and Groundhog Day my own life all the time. Yeah. And I spend a, 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 a bizarre amount of time thinking about it. And you're kind of thinking, well, I'm, I feel like I'm reasonably happy in the present. So why mm. do I spend so much time thinking about it? So it was, this is kind of like the movie was sort of about that, about trying to sort of, the dangers trying to recapture former glories, you know? You talked a lot about how um, this movie was inspired by the idea of going back to your hometown and finding that it's completely changed while you've been gone. Um, but I wonder what, what it's like for you guys now, going back to your hometowns now, uh, now that you're well known. Do people treat you differently? Does it, does it feel like it, maybe when you were going back well, after going to university, that must feel different from what it does now? Well, I sort of had that experience like sort of very vividly because Hot Fuzz was shot in my hometown. So I'd only done like Shaun of the Dead then, so it wasn't like... And I'm not like in front of the camera anyway, but it was kind of funny when... I mean, it was definitely a bittersweet experience. It was mostly great, but there's that weird thing where... One of the things that sort of inspired the movie in a way is that when we were shooting Hot Fuzz and we'd set Sanford as supposed to be this idyllic sort of pastoral kind of haven and yet since I've been away there was now like a Starbucks right in the middle of shot. <laughs> so something like, oh, that didn't actually fit Stanford. So we actually had to digitally erase it from the movie. Wow. And so there's like chains that like you realise that sort of like when you go to London you think, oh, London's like a metropolis and it's all chains. And then when you go back to the country you're thinking, oh, all high streets look the same. It's kind of like just... It's that's that homogeny, um, but I think sort of. Um, so it's it's a, it's a bittersweet experience going back because if you've moved away for work, like you know you can't stay in your hometown. But I think there's always that sort of slight also, guilt about going away and yeah. As a director, behind. though, you because you because you're known, you know, because you spend most of your time, all of your time behind the camera. There, though, you're very known because you're the boy that did well from Wells, you know. So for you to go back there, it's the same for me. If I go, I don't really go out into Gloucester now. When mm. I go home, I go to my mum's and I stay indoors because everyone kind of know because there's always bits in the local paper about you so even if people don't know what you've done they know about you because you're the guy from here that went on and did that you yeah, yeah. was in the film yeah. so it's it's oh. i don't go out <laughs> when we were shooting a scene in uh, hot fuzz i was um it, what was a funny so occasionally you'd see sort of like people you went to school with or teachers and stuff and um there was this girl that i, I don't think i even went out with her i think i got off with her once at a party <laughs> For the US readers, got off means kissing, making out. I know sort of got off is not a phrase. I know you have lots of American listeners, right? <laughs> they don't know the phrase do, got yeah. off. Um, you made out As with I her. find out to my peril. Where is, um, where is that, <laughs> and for American listeners, where is that in terms of bases? Where is that? Is that first, uh, base? first base. First base, okay. But so this is, so I am, I'm, we're outside the news agent filming a scene and some kid comes up to me with a Shaun of the Dead DVD and goes, oh, can you sign my DVD? And just as I get the pen out, this girl comes around the corner and just goes, no, Edgar Wright, I don't want your autograph. <laughs> <laughs> and walks off. Just, uh, just as a measure of uh, <laughs> talking about your uh, maturity when it comes to uh, uh, getting off with and making out, when we were doing the scene in The, in the Mermaid, and Nick and Eddie and I were uh, dancing with the marmalade sandwich. When I was um, m making out with Rose Reynolds, every time we do a snog, Edgar would go <laughs> <laughs> behind the camera. It was so distracting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've really done. I think that's weirdly like the heaviest kind of sex scene I've ever done. Like well, you were, we, we were trying. Kiss. Me and Rose were trying to get like a line of spit to kind of connect us, and uh, it, it was just Edgar's vocal disgust every time. Just as well you didn't do blues, the warmest colour. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you found you've become you're getting recognised a lot more between Shaun of the Dead and, and now? Are people are um, places you can't go without getting mobbed? Or how's that work? I, no, I'm not so much. I mean, I, I get recognised by people who watch uh, extras on, on DVDs. <laughs> so it's nice. I usually sort of like, um, it's, uh, you know, like... I, I was always you get recognised people who know what you do. That's great. That's yeah. good. It's a nice way. To, it's not just... Oh, right, uh, you. <laughs> I love when people call you Shaun of the Dead, like cabbies go, oh, it's Shaun of the Dead! <laughs> yeah. Have you had a tattoo of yourself done? Because <laughs> people tweet you guys pictures of yourselves as tattoos. Right? Yeah, oh, yeah. No, I've, had, I've had more than one person like tattoo my signature onto them. Which I find I somebody wow. like which I I um some some girl like a, a Scott Pilgrim signing in Toronto got the DVD signed and asked me to sign her tummy and then at the screening like four hours later she goes look and pulled up her like midriff and it was very strange and I hope it's healed or you got rid of it since but like <laughs> seeing like your name in like sort of 
bloody raw, recently tattooed. She like, probably did it with herself with a, with a pin and a biro. <laughs> <laughs> but I sort of, I felt, I, I, I was, my, my reaction was completely honest. It goes, why did you do that? <laughs> In that high pitched voice. <laughs> if you're listening out there, I hope it's uh, settled. It's healed. It's you've had, I imagine you've had a lot. Yeah, you've got, you've got lots of there's lots of Sean tattoos all the there, time. Sure. Yeah, because sure, Sean's uh, become a sort of uh, you know uh, in terms of pe- people who are like horror fans and mm-hmm. stuff. It's, I don't know. I've, I've seen I've seen lots and lots, and it's quite strange. And um, I'm always grateful and perplexed by it. But uh, I, yeah, I've got a whole bunch of pictures on my phone yeah. that people have sent me, and it's like, wow, that's such a commitment. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be on your body after I'm dead probably <laughs> you know it's kind of uh, it's very very strange are you I remember, sure about this decision do you yeah. really want to do this Nick and I were, were in, New, in New Mexico and this this guy came out and said can you sign my arm and did exactly the same thing he, 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 came, he, he said I'm, I'm going to get this tattooed just mine and Nick sort of like <laughs> scrolled signatures on his arm but oh god I mean what an amazing thing and, I have know. ITV too Tattoos <laughs> on your eyeballs. <laughs> I have a, I have one more quick question. Um, you can get a Shaun of the Dead action figure. Why can't you get a blank action figure? That would be like, maybe, maybe there, there will be one. I'd like yeah. to see. I'd like to see somebody do an action figure of like Nick, <laughs> like with his still hands. I think that'd be. I think we should try and get because who was it? Uh, Necker did the. Yeah. And also Sideshow did one and. But I'd love to see a because uh, I also thought Nicholas Angel was a great mm-hmm. action figure because he had so many different. You know, you could have him in Cycle Cop and you could have him in Riot Gear and, you know. And I think Gary and the gang would make great action figures. Um, and the blanks, we always kind of said in, in that, that part of the reason that the blanks came apart the way they did was like, you know, the more these kids, these guys regress into their sort of childhood selves, which is what happens when they start to get drunk, they become like they were. Their life becomes like childhood. You know, they, yeah. they're, they're basically playing with these toys and they're covered in blue, which Edgar always cited as being like when you came home from school covered in ink. Yeah. It's like mm-hmm. the, the, the more the night goes on, the more they are surrounded by their past in a weird way. And part of that is the fact that the blanks are like action figures, you know. <laughs> yeah, I would always have like at the end of a school day, inky hands, inky tongue, inkled <laughs> down my shirt. I'd always You're have doing like it wrong, blue man. tongues. <laughs> Because I've been sucking my pen and it had leaked. Blue is the warmest color. <laughs> <laughs> it did not come from any lesbian antics, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, g- going back to how you guys uh, ride together, uh, you, you're in the same room all, at all times? Ooh. You yeah. ever do that Skype thing? We've no. had to like, on occasion, no, only very like do by email maybe. But The cool thing is now, now what we do is we always, one person writes and the other one paces around, but now we get the old... Uh, HDMI cable and plug it into a big TV and then you just have final draft up on the TV so that's the cool thing to do because then it's like so before that it was a bit always a bit like battleships so you sit opposite each other with your laptops facing <laughs> yeah, each other yeah. and one would always be peering over the other shoulder sometimes final draft has that screen share thing that never fucking works yes we tried that a few times then we had drop boxes and things didn't we yeah but then like the advent of like just being able to plug the laptop into the TV is major because now it's like we just have that up you uh, can see it you being you can written. see it big and Whoever's typing can see what the other one's typing and go, no, 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 you know. So when, so we, usually should, like, when we, when we, because it used to be that we'd be over each other's shoulders or whatever, or like, oh, yeah, the battleship uh, uh, thing. I wonder if they wrote battleship like that. The two people, <laughs> <laughs> there's no way that was written by two people. Uh, two, I, mean, I, I say people. Yeah, we wrote the, the, a lot of this when we wrote in um, in LA because I was filming Star Trek Into Darkness and Edgar. Uh, I, every every day I wasn't on that, I'd go to Working Title LA and we'd work in Eric Fellner's office and he's got a lovely big plasma screen. So we had the script was up on this big plasma screen and it was very nice. And, and finally, we'd kind of arrived at this very ideal f- sort of setup, which was really hugely conducive. Do you run lines? Do you do dialogue out loud? And if so, yeah. do Sometimes, you yeah. stick to your character only or do you do both? Yeah, I do Gary and yeah. uh, I did Gary and we, you did everyone else. We actually, you know, we, we had a very clear idea of who we wanted in the script and there was, there was a version of the script that had like Eddie Marzan and Paddy Constantine written in the script yeah. Martin Freeman so that we could hear their, you know, it helped us psychologically. And in terms of um, getting those guys on board though, uh, did you have any struggles in a way getting them on board because I, I spoke to Paddy once and he about this movie and he said that someone at the studio had said that he wasn't handsome enough to play the romantic lead is that is that, <laughs> so full of shit, is that is, no that is no that's true that is how can true. How, how can Paddy not be handsome enough I he's know so, well a, I think to, to be fair like they they were thinking of him mostly in like Born Ultimatum right where he's kind of quite sort of downtrodden whereas we the Paddy that we know you don't often get to see on screen as much which is kind of like handsome Paddy or 
handsome Paddy Super likes cool, sort of doing confident. like um, Northern Soul dancing in that Maloko video. So it's so yeah. I think sort of like to be fair to them, they were thinking of the Paddy Constan they see on screen who. You know, if you if you'd only seen Hot Fuzz and Born After Mating, you go, "Well, that guy, he's the he's the handsome one." But, just, they just <laughs> but he is mentions. in reality, and yeah. if you're listening to this, Paddy, you know you are. And in fact, his rap gift, like sort of like uh, I had written on it, I said, "You were awesome and handsome." <laughs> but he's Freeman's very like sort of isn't it? He's, a, he's difficult. Mer- Martin Freeman's very difficult post Hobbit. He's not a nice guy. <laughs> It became. It actually became a joke on set. They're like, because his last eighteen months of life had been the Hobbit, you know. So every time, every frame of reference for him was the Hobbit. So every time he started speaking, he go, "Oh, when I was in there, we go, oh, shut up." <laughs> and but there was a great night when uh, we were filming out in Letchworth, and this this sort of Brinks map van arrived, full of like it was delivering to a bank. And uh, Paddy said, "Fucking hell, Martin, your Hobbit residuals have arrived." <laughs> <laughs> The main thing was, uh, in terms of getting people of, like, Martin, and we really actually sort of, like, we were very lucky to get Martin at all because it was important to us that Martin, everybody who's in the other two movies is in the third one. And yeah. those people are Simon, Nick, Bill Nye, Rafe Spall, Martin Freeman, Julia Deacon, Patricia Franklin, and Kevin and Nick Wilson. I haven't left anybody out, have I? Uh, Joe Cornish, but he wasn't, no. Well, they're they not in the speaking part. No. In the speaking part, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, because Joe doesn't have a speaking part in the first one, it was not very brief. It's I'm not. Flash. I'm not in there. Oh, the other person is Garth Jennings. Yes. The yes. two people who aren't in it is me and Joe Cornish. Like my, you can hear my voice in World's End, and Joe isn't in it at all. But Garth Jennings is in there as well. Where can we hear your voice? I am uh, in when uh, he walks under the um, the JCB and makes them drop all their bricks. You hear me go, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> there we go, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's you, me. you have an actual cameo in Spaced, but you haven't appeared on screen in, in any of the movies. Uh, no, I'm a zombie in um, Sean. Falls over in some news. I fall time. over in the final sequence. I'm wrong, you're in all of them. <laughs> and then in Hot Fuzz, I'm very briefly in there as a shelf stacker in the ah. background, wearing my old gateway uniform. And I think it was on my birthday, actually. Was it? I think it was on my birthday. Maybe it was on my 32nd birthday or 33rd. A birthday you share with Hitler. <laughs> really? <laughs> I do, don't I? Because yeah. oh. you've talked about your, your dates with your, dra- <laughs> talked about your dates with your drama teacher, who obviously made an impact on Yes. You. So did you, did you do acting back then? Were you into yeah. plays? Yeah, I was in like theatre studies and stuff. I would be... If you see some of my amateur movies, I'm in it a lot more. <laughs> like, um, but I, I think sort of. I, I used to like doing that kind of stuff. But then, um, you know, like I, I'm not. I'm not an actor. And when I when I'm asked to do, like when I'm sometimes I'm asked to do part. I've told a very long story on another thing. I won't get into it. <laughs> I was asked to be in the film Wolverine. <laughs> really? <laughs> Which is true. Like sort of. Like it was as Wolverette. As, no, it's like as this little Wolverine Junior. <laughs> I've got the hair, if not the body. I have not got the body. I do have the hair. X Men Origins but Wolverine or the Wolverine? X Men Origins Wolverine. And you know, like it was. Uh, the, the, I told this story. I would refer you to, so I don't have to get into a fifteen-minute anecdote <laughs> on Kevin Smith's um, uh, Smod filmmakers or something. I can't remember what's called Smod Smodcast. Smodcast. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I tell this whole story. But, no, I have no aspirations to be an actor at all. And, like, look around you is kind of my limit. When you, you know. did the splits. <laughs> yes. But, like, look around you is so easy because look around you is, like, they wanted to cast, like, non-actors, essentially. is most of the people in it that they want to get kind of awkward performances. So I, I never had any aspirations to act. It's funny. I feel, I feel the same way about directing. I'd like to, I would like to direct at some point, but Edgar almost keeps me from it because I think what's the point of doing it unless I have an understanding on a par with Edgar's and Edgar's understanding of the genre the, the genre the medium it, it has always been something of the show that, medium of the show the medium <laughs> uh, has always been something that's kind of um, impressed me that, that on such a level that I'm like well if I can't do it like that what's the point of doing it at all mm. but I, I've, I've, hopefully I eventually will um, try but I don't think I'll ever be as good as he was when he was 20 I just, busy, stand, I just stand behind Simon and say yeah. Uh, <laughs> every time, yeah, your, your, your film will be you'll be starring and there'll be lo- every scene will be a kissing scene that'll be there again. <laughs> <laughs> Simon's kissing a girl could you ever direct Simon in the sex scene I mean, oh I don't know I don't know Nymphomaniac 2 <laughs> <laughs> how about you we can make, we can make up the poster <laughs> I really wish I played I don't right. think I don't think I could direct Simon in a sex scene no be like Dr. Who. <laughs> but weirdly <laughs> enough I went after after the world's end I went and uh, I did another film with Rosamund and we had quite a graphic sex scene in that movie 
And I just remember thinking, I'm so glad Edgar's not here. Because <laughs> it was both of us, you know. That's my neighbour! <laughs> <laughs> and James Rosman fight lives like one street away from me. You know? <laughs> what has been the toughest shot to do in the trilogy? I think, like, when we did Sean and Did, we started with that long steady cam show. It was the first day of the shoot, which is kind of a way of, like, really throwing down the gauntlet of, like, we're going to try something ambitious for the money and for, you know, like, sort of... So we, we start with that steady cam show. What's been something that's really... It's usually not necessarily shots. It's just usually the fucking weather. It's yeah. always the thing that, like, it's just, like, that's usually... The, that's re- usually the, record, the, thing where you the record throwing sequence. But yes. The amount of times it was split up because of the weather. Yes, but that was also, and credit to the DP... When he saw that location, he said, this is a bad idea because this faces north to south and you need some of the faces east to west. And I was like, uh, that'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was like, oh, I see, I see why this is now a major problem. Yeah. Is there stuff with visual, you could have done with visual effects back then that, mm. that you wish you could go back well, and... Well, I, imp- I was impressed by what we were able to do on The World's End. I mean, we, we maybe could have done a few more sort of missing heads and limbs with the zombies, but... Because uh, it was amazing what we could do without a green screen on oh, yeah. the world's end. But um, I'm happy if, with the way everything panned out, you know? Yeah, I don't remember sort of something. I don't remember something that, like, um, usually it's something where, like, um, stunt stuff where you, you only have a number of, like, breakables and then that's it. Yeah. You know, that's usually the thing where it's like, it makes, it makes those sequences really highly charged because you only have maybe three takes at something or five takes at something. So that can be tough. But um, I try to think of a sort of a particularly. It's usually scenes I remember like that was a tough scene, or there's usually like sort of things that we call like Black Wednesday or something. Like the scene in World's End that was the hardest scene wouldn't seem like a very hard scene. It's the scene outside the Mermaid when like everybody's leaving and they run into Martin Freeman mm. and uh, they're talking about um, Bermuda Rhombus and the Aquanazis. It was Martin Freeman had to leave to go to New Zealand the next day, so it was like a hard out and we were gonna lose him the next day. So we had to shoot this scene. We couldn't like restage it inside. And the night was a severe weather warning. It was yeah. literally on everybody's iPhones, that thing of like, you know there's a severe weather warning. <laughs> <laughs> 100 mile an hour gale and like massive but we had a rainstorm. It was like on Martin's reverses, it was really windy. On our reverses, it was really raining. On the side, the, on the wide, it was something else. And yet it cuts together beautifully. You know, yeah. You don't notice but it. at the time, there'd be like the sort of like, I would be in the, the foulest mood. And like, so that's the thing. Usually it's always the weather, and that's when you kind of think, fuck this country. <laughs> fucking weather. <laughs> like, you, I hate the fucking weather in this country. You and Nick had a big barney that night, I remember. I would just, I, I'm te- I, like, when I'm moody, I'm terrible. And, my, and the worst thing that I do is I sort of like rely on my. F- my friendship with Simon and Nick way too much. <laughs> I rely on them way too much to be yeah. like the cheerleaders. And like, strangely enough, like, you know, I didn't do that on Scott Pilgrim versus the world because I didn't know the cast as well. So if I have a major failing and I'll admit it, and I've said it to them as well, is that like, if I'm in a bad mood, I rely on Simon and Nick to kind of keep the crew happy, which is a bad, which is a bad thing. You've got to be the leader and you've got to keep kind of positive because mm. it's not good for crew morale if you can see me like sort of, rubbing my beard furiously and <laughs> like looking dark and moody dark but it and was, we were very up I was just practicing it. for my scene in X-Men Origins we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, we're being wrapped up because we've got to go to a Q&A oh, yeah. Yeah. at the Sydney World Home Market but I'll just ask very very quickly Edgar what can you not tell us about Ant-Man um, I cannot tell you I was thinking to think of a silly like, title or something like um, <laughs> Ant-Man I don't know I haven't got a funny answer I can't tell you anything uh, I thought as much and uh, Simon you're doing Man Up next I am, yes, yeah. yes. Um, with Lake Bell, who I was doing Skype rehearsals with today. She's in Thailand doing a movie with Owen Wilson called The Coup, I think. And uh, I'm very excited about that because she's brilliant. And um, well, it's a big talk thing as well. So with Naira's producing. And well, the cool thing is that both movies are going to be released together as M and Up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you can tell us. Hot there scoop you right up. And then you're doing uh, presumably Mission Impossible 5, Star Wars, Star Trek. Everything. Yeah, all uh, of them. All in the same week? Or, uh, I'm, yeah, I, I know, if, well, I can't, I, all the Star Wars questions are moot because I will be busy when Star Wars is shooting with, um, with Mission 5 and Star Trek 3 if all goes to plan. Mm-hmm. You know, that's... And I'm also possibly doing something in between Man Up and um, and Mission, which I can't we, we speak like, about right now. Okay. We like starting the rumor that the third Star Trek is called Star Trek Into Jelly. <laughs> <laughs> if the Enterprise lands on a blancmange planet, <laughs> and it's called Star Trek Into Jelly. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good note to end, Edgar. Simon, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Cheers. Empire readers. <laughs> Fuck you.